I'll stand in awe of the one who made it all. That is a glorious truth. That we are able to stand in worship in honor of our great God. This morning, I, I want to go over the lyrics to that song again because there is a rich truth that's there that I want us to see. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion. It all begins with the glory of God as the creator of all things. And it says, my soul now to stand. So our response to the glory of God, him as creator of all things, is that our soul stands in worship of the one true God. It says, you stood before my failure and carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed down upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. And so we stand in overflowing joy because of what Christ has done on the cross for us that we may know him and his glory. And so it goes on to say, so what could I say, what could I do, but offer this heart, O God, completely to you? So I'll walk upon salvation, your spirit alive in me, this life to declare your promise, my soul now to stand. So the song asks, what is the response to this unbelievably good truth that we have? The response is, this life to declare your promise, my soul now to stand, I will go. So when we see the glory of God, our response is to stand in awe of the God of all glory. And when we stand in awe of him, and when we worship the God of all glory, the only response at that point that makes any sense is for us to look out and say, I want this glory to go forth and be made known in all the world. I want the world to make much of this one who is worthy of all worship. The truth that this song proclaims is that the worship and the glory of the living God leads us to proclaim the glory and the goodness of this, of this God to a world who desperately needs him. Isn't, isn't this the picture that we get in Isaiah chapter 6? When Isaiah sees, gets a glimpse of the majesty and glory of God, and God brings this forgiveness into his life, and he stands, and what does he say? Lord, here am I, send me. Because the response of seeing God in his glory, getting this glimpse of the majesty and the goodness and the graciousness and the mercy of God leads us, it drives us to proclaim that goodness and that graciousness and that mercy and that glory to all the rest of the world. The truth this morning that I want us to see from God's word is that the worship of God is the fuel of for the proclamation of the gospel. Worship of God is the fuel, it's what drives us in proclaiming the gospel. This morning we're in our our third message in a short series on the gospel. Last Sunday morning we saw that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. Romans uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and 17, we saw the gospel is the power of God for salvation. It's not the message about God's power, but it is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. It's not our strategies, it's not our clever words, it's not our impressive programs, it's not our church buildings, it's none of those things that bring people salvation. It is the power of God through displayed through the gospel. Then on Sunday night, we discussed how prayer it gives us access to the power that unleashes the gospel. The way that that God has chosen to empower the movement, the advance of the gospel, the work of the gospel in the lives of the lost, it is through prayer. The way the gospel works through our lost friends, our neighbors, we move out into the Chonkai River Valley in Peru and all these different areas that we talk about is empowered through the prayers of God's people in a way that I cannot fully describe, that I, I cannot fully say to you, God uses our prayers, the prayers of his people, to advance the gospel here and around the world. And and we saw that as we pray, God grants his people boldness. Even the Apostle Paul, we talked about how he prayed that God's people would, would ask that he would have boldness. Even the Apostle Paul, so that even prayer is used for giving us boldness in proclaiming the truth of the gospel. 
So prayer gives us access to the power that unleashes the gospel. And if prayer empowers the advance of the gospel, then it is worship that fuels. It's worship that drives us to make the gospel known here and around the world. Turn with me to Psalm 96 this morning. Psalm 96, here we're going to see that God-centered, God-exalting worship fuels the proclamation of the gospel of God's glory, for God's glory, to the ends of the earth. Psalm 96. This psalm begins with worship. Verse 1, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth. And so then from there it moves into making the goodness of God known to all the world. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. And so I want you to notice here that it, it's speaking of making the goodness, the glory of God known to all the nations of the world. It's basically in New Testament terms we would call this sharing the gospel here and around the world. And so I want you to notice the progression so far. We've got beginning here with worship, that's verse 1. And in verse 2 and 3, we start this progression outward, moving outward, so worship being moved outward into the world. And so that those who do not know Christ, who do not know God, hear the truth of God and become worshipers of God themselves. Uh, and so the reason for that now is given in verse 4. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. So what these verses do, these verses give the ground, the reason, the foundation for everything that goes before it. And, and so I want you to notice how the psalmist sets this up here. He, he starts out with worship there in verse 1. Verses 2 and 3, he deals with worship going out to the nations so the rest of the nations become worshipers. And then verse 4, 5, and 6, he tells the reason for that happening. The reason that we make God's glory known, that we proclaim his goodness, that we share the gospel, is so that the rest of the world will worship God, so that those who are not worshipers will become worshipers of God. And so the truth that's found here, verses 4, 5, and 6, that our God is great and greatly to be praised, that all the gods of the peoples are idols, that Lord made the heavens, that splendor and majesty are before him, strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Those truths right there serve as the reason for verses one through three. And this is what we're going to deal with this morning. So what I want us to do is I want us to start. I want us to start with one foundational truth. One foundational truth this morning and see three implications that flow out of that one foundational truth. And the one foundational truth is that God is worthy of all glory. Foundational truth. God is worthy of all glory. So let's look more in depth at verses 4, 5, and 6 there, because that's where we see this. This one foundational truth. God is worthy of all glory. Let's start again. Verse 4 there. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. It starts off with this simple truth, statement that, that God is great. You know, this is a statement that we would say is a very simple thing to say about God. It's one of those simple truths that we learn when we're kids. If I went back into children's church right now where the four, five, and six-year-olds are, and I asked them, what is God like? Inevitably, at least one of those kids is gonna say, God is great. Because it's a simple truth about who God is. But the reality of saying that God is great is a rich theological truth about God. Because the reality is, is that there is no one like him. No one can be compared to God. So we can say that God is the great one. There is none like him. Because the psalmist here tells us that the greatness of God means that he is to be praised above all other gods. That's what he says in verse 4 there. He is to be feared above all other gods. Notice there that it's gods with lowercase g. And so it's a word in the Hebrew that basically means not gods. God is above all those not gods that are out there in the world. In other words, there's only one God. 
There are no others because all the others are not gods. They're merely idols. They're nothings in this world. In contrast to that, the Lord made the heavens. The nothings have done nothing. There are no gods. But the one true God, the great one, made the heavens. Now, this, this is a truth here that I don't want us to miss. And that is that only God is the sovereign creator. Now, for most of us, that's a, that's a pretty basic truth. You know, we learned that in, in early Sunday school when we're kids, that there is only one God who is the creator of all things. So that's, for a lot of us, that's a, a well-duh statement. Yeah, we know that. We know that truth. But this is a truth that has implications that are absolutely life-altering. So I want you to think about this for just a second. If God is the only creator, if there is no other God, then there is none other who is worthy of all worship. If there is no other creator, and if there is no other God, then there is only one who is worthy of all glory and honor and worship. That means that all glory, all honor, from everything in the universe, from everything in our lives, is due to this one creator, God. And so that's the point of what the psalmist is saying here. He's saying that the Lord is the creator. The Lord is this all-glorious one. He says there that this is the one who has splendor and majesty before him. This is the one that has strength and beauty. He's describing this as if the glory of God is radiating out these things. It's like the, the infinite glory of God is bursting forth, and we see from that infinite glory, these rays of splendor and these rays of majesty and these rays of the goodness and the strength and the beauty of God. And when we see that, we see this infinitely glorious, this infinitely indescribable God. And if that is the truth about who God is, is he, if he is infinitely glorious, if he is indescribably great, if he is the one and only creator, then the truth is that he acts and he works for his own glory alone. The acts of God are for his own glory. Think about that for just a moment. Who should God act for? Who should he make much of? Who should he do all his actions for? Who should he be seeking to bring glory to? Is it me? Should God be seeking to bring glory to me? Absolutely not. Because who is the only one who is worthy of all glory and honor? God, right? The sovereign creator. So that means everything that he does is for his own glory. All the works of God are for him to be and receive glory. As this is why he says, Isaiah 48, 11, for my own sake, for my own sake, I will act. Why will God act? For his own glory. And so he says, For how can my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. God will not share his glory because nothing else and no one else deserves all glory and honor. All right, so this is our foundational truth. We're going to stick with this. Hold that in your mind. Foundational truth here. Only God is worthy of all glory, honor, and worship. All right, now I want you to see three implications that flow out from that. Implication number one. Worship is is the primary duty of all of creation. Worship is the primary duty of all creation. Look at verse one. Go back to that. Sing to the Lord, a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. So he's saying, all the earth, this is what you are to do. Sing unto the Lord. And so why does the psalmist say you're to sing to the Lord? Why is he saying all the earth, all creation, sing out unto God? It's because what we've already said. Sing unto the Lord, Four in verse four, because in verse four, because this is who God is. And so if God is the only one who is worthy of glory, if God is the only one who is worthy of all praise and honor, if he is this infinitely glorious one who radiates out splendor and majesty and honor and praise, all these different things, then our primary duty is to worship him. My job, your job, is to worship the creator. It's written all over the words of scripture. Psalm 97.1, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. Psalm 67.3, let the peoples praise you, O God, let the peoples praise you. 
Psalm 117, 1, praise the Lord, all nations. You move over into the New Testament, just in the book of Ephesians, stick just the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, three different times God says that our salvation is for the praise of his glory. Ephesians 1, verse 4 through 6. In love he predestined us to adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Why have we received adoption? Why has he chosen us for himself? It's to the praise of his glory of his grace. So he will receive the glory from it. Ephesians 1.12, to the end that we who are the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of, his, praise of his glory. Why have we been given salvation? So that we will be praising to him. So that we, he will receive the glory as we worship him as he chooses us for himself. Ephesians 1, verse 13 through 14. You were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. All of this, all this working of salvation that Paul is describing in Ephesians chapter 1 sums it up here. It's all to the praise of his glory. So why have we been given salvation? It's so that we might worship him, so that he might receive all worship and honor. So the duty of all of creation, especially of us who are believers, is to worship the one true God. He is infinitely glorious. He is perfectly righteous. He is perfectly holy. He is the only only one who is worthy of all worship and honor. And so when we recognize that truth, the only legitimate response we can have is to say that we will worship this one who is worthy of all glory and honor. Anything less than our lives being given to his worship, to his glory, is less than what is honoring to such an infinitely glorious God. This is part of the reason that we gather here each week. We gather here together this morning, all this 350, however many people we have right here, we're gathered to worship God because of his infinite glory. And so if you've been here for a while at Grace, you know that when we're here in this room, we do things so that we'll be focused entirely upon God. When we sing songs, we sing songs that are focused upon God's goodness, his greatness, his glory. It's not songs that we sing about ourselves. And we don't do a lot in here that that isn't about God. Everything that we do here is about God. And so we do sermons, when we preach sermons here, it's to be God-centered, focused on God. When we do, uh, when we pray, it's prayers that are focused on God. When we do scripture reading, it's about God. Everything that we do in here is about God because when we gather in this place, it's for the purpose of worshiping the one true God because we recognize that no one else in here is worthy of worship. Are you worthy of worship? Absolutely not. So when we gather in here, our purpose is to worship the only one who is worthy of that. That's not just in here. Every aspect of our lives is to be given unto the worship, unto the glory of the one true God. So that everything that we do points to God and seeks to bring him honor, seeks to bring him glory. So that's the first implication. Worship is the primary duty of all creation first implication. The second implication is that evangelism and missions exist because worship does not. Evangelism and mission exists because worship does not exist. I'll explain that here in a second. Several years ago, I read a book that has had a profound impact on my understanding of evangelism and missions. And it makes a statement that has affected my understanding of proclaiming the gospel. And I haven't yet found a statement that better summarizes this truth. And it says, missions exist because worship doesn't. Missions exist because worship does not exist. Remember what we've already said, worship is the primary purpose of all creation, right? But we recognize, we know that there are people out in the world who are not worshipers of the one true God. And so because we know that there are people who are not worshipers of the one true God, we go out to them proclaiming the truth of the one true God so that they will become worshipers of him. That's the point that we see here in verse 1, 2, 3, and 4. Listen to this. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Purpose is that we'll be worshipers of God. And so sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations. Why do we do that? So that they will become worshipers also. Missions exist, evangelism exists, because there are people who are not worshipers of the one true God. Why do we tell our neighbors about Christ? So that they will become worshipers of the one true God. 
Missions exist because worship doesn't. And so when we proclaim the gospel, when we tell our neighbors, when we tell our friends, when we speak to our coworkers, when we share the gospel with our teammates, with the person who sits behind, beside us at school, when we take it to the unreached peoples around the world, when we take the gospel to the Chonkai River Valley or to the unreached peoples of Kazakhstan or Somalia or wherever, wherever it might be, the reason that we're doing it is that, so that they will become worshipers of God. Missions exist because worship does not. And here's the thing. We want people to see the indescribable glory of our God. We want them to see the absolute majesty and the splendor and the mercy and the goodness and the righteousness of God. We want them to see what verse 6 says. Splendor and majesty and strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. The goal of missions, the goal of me and you proclaiming the gospel is for our lost friends and family, our neighbors, co-workers, whoever it might be, is for them to give the glory that is due to God. John Leonard Dobear and David Nitschman were young men in the early 1700s when they were sitting in church one Sunday and heard their pastor tell about an island in the West Indies where there was an atheist slave owner. And this atheist slave owner had 3,000 slaves on his plantation. And so these 3,000 slaves would live and die without ever hearing the name of Jesus Christ. And so these men began talking about that island. And so they came up with the idea that they would sell themselves into slavery on that island so that the men and women, boys and girls there, would hear the name of Jesus Christ. And so they set sail for that island. And the story goes that when they set sail from that island, as the boat was leaving, they cried out to the people who were on the shore, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of, of his suffering. The reward that is due to the lamb for his suffering is the unending praise of all peoples for all time. And so they were going out to this place in order that the people there might praise him forever, that he might receive all the worship that is due him. And so our goal in proclaiming the good news of Christ is that he will receive all the glory that is due him. And so that all the peoples who do not know him will become worshipers of the one true God. So our foundational truth, God is worthy of all glory and praise. Implication number one from that is that worship is the primary duty of all of creation. Implication number two is that evangelism and missions exist because worship does not. Our final implication is that worship is the fuel of missions. Worship is what drives us to do missions. John Piper said, Passion for God in worship precedes the offer of God in preaching. You can't command what you don't cherish. Missionaries will never call out, Let the nations be glad, who themselves cannot say from the heart, I rejoice in the Lord, I will be glad and exult in him. I will sing praise to his name. Missions begins and ends in worship. If you're a believer, then you know that there is an indescribable joy that comes from being in the presence of God in worship. If you are a follower of Christ and have encountered him, then you have gotten a taste. You've gotten a glimpse of the goodness and the glory and the graciousness of God. And when we gather together in worship, there is something that happens in which we are drawn into the presence of God and we worship him and sing out to him. And there is a joy that comes with standing and saying that God is great. There's a joy that comes in singing about the awesome 
power, the holiness of God, these different songs that we sang this morning. There is an inexpressible, indescribable joy that we as believers have when we get to worship God in this way. And the scriptures speak about this joy that we have in worship. Psalm 84 says, How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Psalm 84, 10, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. Anything in the presence of God is better than a million years outside of his presence. Psalm 16, 11, In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. And so what happens is when we worship, when we draw into the presence of God, we get this glimpse, this glimpse of the splendor and the majesty and the glory of God. And, and, and when that happens, we have this desire to make that splendor and that majesty and that greatness and that glory known. Because when you see something like that, the only response is to say, I want this to be known. I want this glory that I can't even put into words to be spread out among the rest of the world. And and so what we have here is this seeking, us desiring to give God the glory that he deserves by making his goodness and his grace, his glory known. Isn't this exactly what we see in Isaiah, what we've already mentioned? Isaiah sees a glimpse of the glory of God. He has this throne room vision. He receives forgiveness from God. What does he do? He says, here am I, send me. Let me make your greatness known. So here's the key. Desire for the king and for his glory leads us to make his kingdom known. When Andrew Murray was thinking about this issue, and he was considering that so few people were giving themselves to making the gospel known here and around the world. This, this is what he wrote. The enthusiasm of the kingdom is missing, and that is because there is so little enthusiasm for the king. Perhaps the reason that the gospel does not go forth more is because God's people don't have more enthusiasm for the God of the gospel. Because a deep longing and yearning and passion and desire and worship of the king leads us to desire for others to know that worship and that passion. You see, we we don't work up a desire for the lost to know Christ. It's not something that we try to stir up in ourselves to say, I I need to feel more for those who don't know Christ. Instead, what we do is we fix our gaze upon God and we see him in his indescribable glory and greatness. And what happens then is we are fueled, we are energized, we are given passion for that greatness, that glory of God to be made known across the world. Because that's the only response when we start to see, when we get a glimpse, when we worship God in the splendor of who he is. So worship fuels evangelism. Worship, worship fuels mission. Worship fuels us to desire for our neighbors and for our coworkers and our friends and the Chonkai River Valley and the unknown people groups all around the world. It fuels us to desire them to know Christ so that he will receive that glory and that honor that he deserves. So I want to leave us with two questions this morning. Two questions for us to ask ourselves to help consider this passage. Question number one, how is our worship? Question number one, how is our worship? And and what I mean is, is our worship so centered upon God that we are passionate about worshiping him? So when you come in here, what's your focus? When you come in here on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night, what is your goal? What is your focus when you're in here? Do you find that your mind is wandering? Do you find that you are mouthing the words to songs that you've sung a hundred times before? And while you're saying the words, your mind is somewhere else? Or 
when you're in here, do you say, better is one day in the presence of the Lord than a thousand elsewhere? What about, what about in your private worship? Is it, is it a private worship that is zealous, that is passionate for God and for his glory? Does your worship lead you into this white-hot zeal for God? So that's question number one. Question number two, how is worship fueling or driving our desire to proclaim the gospel? How is worship driving us in that? So I want, I want to be really honest with you. If, if you're honest and if I'm honest, there are probably a, a, sometimes, maybe a lot of times in our lives when we could say, my desire for the gospel isn't what it should be. When I, I don't long for the nations to know Christ as I should. When I don't have enough concern for my neighbor's salvation as I should. If we're honest, I think we'll say that. And is it possible that those times of, of lack of zeal, lack of concern for the gospel, lack of making the glory of God known, is because our enthusiasm for the king has waned? So instead of trying to work up this feeling let us worship God and let the worship of God fuel us for the advancement of the gospel. Let a passion for God's glory, let a hunger for being in his presence, let a longing for his glory being made known across the world, for the lamb receiving the honor that is due him, the reward for his suffering, let that drive us to making his glory known here and around the world. So if, if we don't have this kind of drive, perhaps we need to ask ourselves if our enthusiasm, if our passion for our king isn't right. And so is your worship fueling you to make God's glory, his goodness, known to a lost world? Because when we get a glimpse of God's glory, when we worship him in spirit and truth for who he is, then that drives us to have the rest of the world see how good and how great he is. Worship fuels mission. Worship fuels making the gospel known for God's glory. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do come before you in praise this morning, recognizing that you are the one true God and that there is none who compares to you. God, this morning, I pray that you will fix our hearts on you. Even as we sing here in a moment about coming back to the heart of worship, God, I pray that if any of us have simply mouthed words this morning, that you will draw us into true worship of you, focused, centered upon you, giving you praise for who you are. And God, if any of our enthusiasm, passion for you has waned, God, may you stir in us a greater desire for you, a greater worship of you. And God, if any of us have grown cold in our longing for your glory to be made known to the world, God, I pray this morning that you will use our time of worship to give us a glimpse of your greatness so that we might long and hunger for that greatness to be made known throughout the world. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen.